So as you see, my interest is very similar to what Ari say, which is animal collective behavior or animal coordination. So, you know, some animal, social animals um, show highly coordinated behavior like this or these birds, you know, to dive into the water to get your prey items. Or, you know, even small scale like this, as some, you know, a black fly larvae coordinate each other to move the new place. Right. So the amazing thing about these phenomena is that no leaders, no central control is there, but they can actually show um, highly coordinated behavior as a group. Right. So this is my favorite example. I say I'm from Japan, and this is a video I found online. And as far as I know, this is before the shopping mall. Uh, opened and people made a line. I think it, it's a big sale day or something, but they just entered to the store like very quickly. Again, no one there what to do, what to, you know, like go there, but like they just want to shop very much. So they just go there very efficiently. Again, no one there, but still they, in this case, humans show very highly coordinated behavior, right? And my center question is like, how they achieved it, you know, achieved that. To tackle this question, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about fire ants. So I'm gonna go over, just in case you've never been to South in the US, I wanna go over the ecology of fire ants a little bit. So they're from, uh, originally from Brazil, and they came here about eight years ago to the US. And this is a picture I took in my town, Athens in Georgia, in the US. And these, each mount is a fire ant mount. And colony is, you know, composed of over 10,000 ants. And if you, you know, accidentally step on it or put the hand on it, it's not going to be fun. They're pretty aggressive. In fact, actually, last week I was waiting at the stop line, stop sign, and then I stepped on that mount. I didn't realize until I started biking again. And it was, it was quite painful if you know fire ants. Anyway, so here, the phenomenon I'm going to talk about is actually self-assembly bridges. Um, so here's the water. And in the second, you see uh, food in the middle here. And then this is the nest. And once you put the food, they actually start making a bridge or a pontoon bridge more accurately, I guess. And they reach the food, again, using their own body as a bridge. And you might think actually that's just lab induced phenomenon, but it's actually it's not. It is actually you can observe in nature. So this is a video taken by Allison after heavy rain in Texas. So they do actually make form a um, bridge like this in nature. And you might also think like, well, I've seen these bridges, you know, by army ants or weaver ants, right? And it's true, actually, these are amazing uh, studies. But one main difference about this fire ant um, bridge phenomenon is that actually you can induce easily in the lab. So these two species, army ants and uh, weaver ants, usually that experiments have been done in the field, and which is great. But because of that, it's really hard to control um, some variables, right? For example, this, you might have seen this experiment, a V-shaped uh, bridge, and then, you know, army ants form a bridge um, between the B, right? And there are some theoretical papers showing that depend on the group size, you know, where the bridge is um, formed, can, I mean, form can be determined optimally, right? So basically, like, the given the group size where the bridge is, you know, um, should be determined by the group size. Like, you know, if the group size is bigger, it can go actually farther from that, you know, connection. But if the group size is small, it should go closer. But again, because of the feedback, it's really hard to control the uh, group size. So, you know, it's not nice mathematical model and theoretical work has been done, but it's really hard to test the idea but for fire ants, for example, you can actually do that and then you can control a group size or, you know, change some variables here. So, you know, one of my students is actually testing this idea by changing group size and, you know, other variables to see how these variables affect, 
you know, where they make bridges, how thick the bridge is. But here, I'm gonna go one by one the questions. So the first question is, can they collectively make the shortest path, right? So I put, in the original video, I put the food in the middle, but if I put off center, can they actually make the bridge close to the food? In this case, actually, this is the shortest path. In this video, as you see, they do make the shortest path. And we did try many times, and as you can see, actually, they, they do successfully repeatedly, right? So they actually can make the shortest path. And the question is, like, how do they actually know that shortest path? So one possibility is visual, but other more um, possible um, candidate is that they might use actually smell, right? So they ends up often use chemical cues to communicate whether to assess environments. So with, or maybe they use odor cues. So to test the idea, what we did was we put a tube like this and flow air. And she actually, they start forming the bridge here, right? So if they start uh, forming the bridge here, that means actually they probably use the um, order queue because that's the strongest queue, right, for the order. And to do that, we actually automate it um, for counting ends or are estimating the number of ends. So in this case, actually, you know, we just measure the ends where they are automatically. And by doing so, now we can actually see where the ends are, right? So in this case, the, the graph here, the x-axis angle from the, you know, the line where the order should be, right? So if many ends are at zero degree, that means actually they probably use the order queue. So the y-axis number ends around that area. So use, as I say, you know, the empirical data supported my idea, which is, they do go tend to aggregate and form a bridge around the zero degree where the you know most strong smell is. And to confirm that they don't use the tube where the air comes out, we don't we put the tube but no air came out and to see if they actually um, don't form the um, uh, bridge around the zero degree. And indeed, they don't really use that tube as a queue to form the bridge. Actually, they're everywhere. The, the bridge can be everywhere, you know, um, from zero degrees. So that confirms that they don't use the tube. They most likely use the smell, the order queue to form the bridge. And now, how they actually you make, you know, not just shortest, but also single path, which is kind of amazing if you look at this, because each end has very local information. So Initially, they make multiple bridges, and then the multiple, these multiple bridges keep growing. And after that, like once the bridge, one bridge keep, you know starts winning, the other bridge actually starts shrinking. And then once they reach the food, other bridges basically disappear. So it looks like each end has certain rules. But these certain, but even though each end just follows certain rules, they can actually collectively, you know, um, form the shortest and single path. Right? So to investigate that idea, we've um, created agent-based model. So the basic idea here is each end, in this case, agent in the computer, has a set of rules, right? And these rules actually basically, you know, use local information. It's not like the ant knows the global information, like right? you know, where the longest path or longest bridge is. And the possible rules can be obtained from empirical data, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So basic idea here again is that each ant has a set of simple rules and then these uh, rules um, use only local information. Right? So one thing we noticed, <clears throat> I'm sorry, is that so when ants go to the tip of the bridge, they either turn back or they stay and they reinforce the bridge. Right. So the red one in this case is actually, she goes to the tip of the bridge, but then she goes back. She turns around and then she goes back to the beginning. But the blue one, she just stays. She makes, she extends the bridge. And that depends on where they are, right? So as they get closer to the food, 
they are more likely extend the food the bridge, right? But if they are far away from the bridge, they actually tend to just turn around and go back, you know, to the nest. So based on these these uh, data, we just made a simple agent based model. So each agent goes to the edge randomly, and they go to the um, food as close as they can. If there is a bridge, they just go on the bridge and they, they call closer to the food. And either they join the bridge according to the function I just showed, what the data. And you know, if they don't uh, join the bridge, they just go back. Like they don't make the bridge. And after a certain time, tau, they just leave. You know, um, even though they made the bridge, but no one is actually you know, extending the bridge, they just give up and then they go back. Right? So that's that simple agent best model, right? And this is the result. So obviously left one is the agent based model and the right one is empirical results. <clears throat> Even though these um, rules are very simple, they actually show very similar pattern to the, what we saw in the experiment, right? It's not like just they look similar, but also you look at you know um, patterns how they form is very similar. So that in this case, red one is the model, agent based model data, and then what the blue one is the experimental data. You see, like initially they accelerate and then they just you know saturate. They you know slowly um, extend the bridge, right? And the great thing about the agent based model is actually now we can make a prediction based on the model and see if that's true. That happens in the nature, right? In in the ends. So in this case, for example, we actually put two like um uh, beginning, like the, the base here. So they can actually this has advantage already close to the food, right? In this case, what happens for the agent based model is actually they form two bridges. Right. So that's what we predicted based on the simple rules we made. You know, okay, so like if if the two areas are closer to the food slightly, they just move from two bridges. Oops. And this is exactly what we found in the data. So they just form two bridges nicely. And we're happy with the model, but then one thing we noticed, or you might have noticed, is that actually this quite gap here. So what it means is that initially, in the both model and the experiment, they extend the bridge fast, but in the experiment, they actually extend the um, bridge much faster than you know what we what our model showed, right? And we kind of scratch our heads, and you know we, this is kind of weird, we're just like what is this? But then. When we were watching the videos more closely, you know, it's actually a lot of rafting there. I don't know if you can see here, like it's actually rafting there, and then these rafts join the existing bridge, and then that you know accelerates the forming of the bridge. That's basically what's causing because actually we may we reverse the model based on that. So now, you know, some probability they actually make a raft and then. In that case, actually, very similar pattern we show. Actually, that gap, you know, I just showed like acceleration at the beginning. Actually, this agent based model showed that gap. Actually, now very, they create the um, bridge um, as, you know, fast like that these ends, real ends do. Right? So we're very happy about this. So the model is good. So now the question was actually, these ends who raft, do they do intentionally? In other words, do they launch intentionally so that they want to be rafting or they just raft, you know, like accidentally? Right? So to investigate it, I started with a uh, fishes and then they actually say like, oh, how about cherry effect? You know, so you might have that effect. Basically, like when you put the cherry in the bowl, the cereal, these cherries actually tend to cluster in the bowl, in the milk, or they actually tend to go to the edge. And it's called Cheerio effect. It's a kind of uh, physics phenomenon. So the idea here is basically that if the Cheerio gives them a concave shape 
and then the edge also has a concave shape. Therefore, it's like a magnet. It actually gets attracted. Right? So that's why the if you put the Cheerio in the milk, it gets attracted and then goes to the edge. Or if you put multiple Cheerios, I don't know how that's how you say Cheerios. I guess so. A multiple Cheerio rings, you know, they, they tend to cluster more. And it's not always that, right? It's not always if you put objects in the um, milk, they get attracted. It's actually, as I say, it's concave and concave. That's why they are attracted. But if you put concave and convex, like this case is like, this is actually convex and this is concave like stereo. If they are together, they actually um, oh, um, repel to each other. They don't like, you know, they don't get attracted. It's in fact that like they repel, right? And then you might think like, why well, I'm talking about this? Like, this is a little bit interesting, but it's, it's how it's rated, but it's actually rated so much because some um, insects, you know, living on the water and they want to go to the uh, surface, actually, because of the, you know, the con <laughs> uh, convex and concave effect, I just show, you know, some insects have a hard time to go to the um, ground, right? Because they, they kind of repel, they get pushed away from the edge. But some insects actually change their body shape so that they actually get sucked into the edge, right, like that. And this actually phenomenon has been known, you know, over 30, it's actually 90, sorry, 1945, so like 80 years ago, like, you know, it's almost, you know, that, uh, but it was written in Japanese, so it wasn't popular. Um, one of my colleagues actually found this paper, like English summary, and you know, I usually don't have any advantage for speaking Japanese, but this is the time I, I had a huge advantage for speaking Japanese, and you know, I could actually read and I can actually explain what, what this means. But you know, basically, this paper shows you know some insects again, you know, they they change their body shape to um to the edge. Right and to suck into the edge, and then they how that's how they actually go to the ground. So now let's look at the ant again. Like this is the ant, and this is the edge. And if you see the gaster, so when if they wanna uh, lunge from the edge, what they have to do is actually they have to curl up so that now it's com you know convex shape, and then this is because this is a you know, concave shape, it's going to be different. So in other words, if that gas dust goes down, that means, you know, they land. But it's indigenous. So it's a bit hard to see maybe on your side, but it's actually curls up and then that's like, it, at least you can see like the end got pushed from the side, right? So right now, what we're trying to do is is it intentional or it's just like they just move around and just, you know, they struggle and then just happen to be that shape, that posture, therefore they got launched. So that's what we're actually trying to do. But it's kind of interesting question, I think, like, do they do that intentionally or not? I think physically. So if you remember the title of my talk, like you think like what, what but you say collective coordination, collective learning, like what happened to collective learning? So the idea here is actually if we induce many times about you know the this phenomenon basically we ask them to form a bridge every day you know over a week do they actually form a bridge better and faster right so that's a question and then we, uh in short answer is in progress we we've done once and then the data so far promising but i thought n equals one is not really good to show yet but at least you know it did n equals one so far so good it means that they do and they actually form a bridge faster. So they coordinate, but the coordination becomes more efficient as they do more, right? But I'm gonna introduce a one phenomenon similar to this idea. So if you know ants, or if you've actually reared ants in your house or somewhere, you know, you might have noticed if you give food, sticky food, like honey or something, they like it initially, but after a while, actually, they start covering that sticky surface, like it's honey, even it's food, but they start, they use um, any substance to cover that area because they don't like any sticky surface. So that's a we kind of- We have about five, uh, four or five minutes. Just yes, to yes, like yeah. 
I should be done. Thank you. So what you see here is a, so this is the food was sorry food is you know surrounded by bathing and then these are the um, the sub basic substances like you know um, particles like they can use to cover that area. And as you see, they use that substance to cover the bathing area to get to the food, right? Over time. So the question here is like if again like similar to the bridge, what I said, if we ask them to do that many times, do they actually make this, you know, path basically to the food more efficient, right? And this is what we found. So the X axis is the trial number. So four times each colony was asked to do. And then Y axis is the, uh, the area that covered, because they don't want to cover the entire area because what they need is they just need a path to get to the food. So it's more efficient if they cover you know, narrower area, right? So that area goes down as they experience more. As you see in the picture, you might see better. Like, so that's a fast trial, second trial, third trial, fourth trial. It's like short path, but that's what they need, right? So it becomes more efficient over time. And these are my collaborators. So this is a collaboration um, between um, U, uh, UGA, me, Georgia Tech and then ASU and um, you know different about computer science, um, physics and ecology or biology, me. And I think this is it. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. This is absolutely fascinating. Thank you.